what the hell, Wizards? You had an opportunity here to provide a fantastic framework for something that could be really cool for the players, and this is what you did. Greetings gamers, I'm Anto, and it's finally here. Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is now available, and today we're going to be diving into it, taking a look at what's inside, and I'm going to be giving you my thoughts on it. I'm also going to be giving away a copy of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, so stick around to the end of the video to find out how to be in with a chance of getting it. Now, I've been looking forward to this book for a long time. Xanathar's Guide to Everything is probably my favourite book in the 5e lineup, and when it was announced we would be getting another rule book in that style, I was very excited. Now, like Xanathar's guide before it, Tasha's Cauldron is kind of an odd mix of player options and DM tools. For the players, there are 22 new subclasses, including at least one new subclass for each of the 13 official classes. Now, most of this material is either reprinted from other sources like Eberron or Theros, or it's an evolution of unearthed arcana material. This is very similar to how Wizards did things with Xanathar's, and it's how I expect they'll continue to do things in the future books too. And it's good that material gets a decent amount of playtesting, but what this means is that there's very little here that's truly new. And if you're someone who keeps up with all the Unearthed Arcana and all the supplement books, you might not be overly impressed with what's on show in terms of class options. But if you're a player who doesn't follow the Unearthed Arcana stuff, there's a lot of stuff to sink your teeth into here. A highlight for me was the new optional class features, which are additional features that you can add on to characters at certain levels. There is quite a disparity between which classes get what features here though. The likes of the Cleric get three new class features and a replacement feature, but the likes of the Rogue only get one new class feature. This is almost certainly a balancing choice, but it would have been nice for each of the classes to get a similar amount of lev. Still, I expect most players will be petitioning their DMs to make use of these new features, as most of them are additional class features, which just means more character options. But I think the highlight for me in the new character section was the Armor Artificer subclass. This subclass essentially turns you into Iron Man, allowing you to bond with your armor, infuse it with powers, and then use it in ways that are really similar to Iron Man, such as firing energy blasts from your hands or your chest. As a Guardian Armorer, you can use your Thunder Gauntlets to deal 1d8 thunder damage and impose disadvantage on the target's next attack, and the defensive field gives you temp HP, which is really nice. As the Infiltrator, you get those Repulsor Beam-style ranged attacks, your speed increases, and you get advantage on stealth. Also, for those of you running a lower magic setting, the Rep Replicate item feature that the Artificer gets is a really good benchmark for the kind of magic items that you're more likely to find out in the world. Now when it comes to weak points for character options, for me it's got to be the Ranger, which gets kind of a half rework here, with most of its optional features being replacements for the base class features. The reason I don't like this is because it introduces another kind of version of the class that players can choose from. We get the base class in the PHB, the revised Ranger in Unearthed Arcana, and now this kind of Tasha's version of the Ranger. And one more options is usually a good thing, this version of the Ranger just feels like another half step trying to fix what's wrong with the base class. Personally, I would have preferred them to do a complete rework of the Ranger in this book and present it as kind of a standalone optional class rather than trying to patch the holes in the base class. I actually have my own version of the Ranger which completely rebuilds the class from the ground up to be much more martial focused and tries to get closer to that core archetype of Aragorn style Ranger of the Wilds. You can pick up the latest version of that over on my Patreon page link in the description, and I'll do a full video on the design of that coming soon. The other big part of the first chapter is the section on customizing your character. I recently did a video talking about my house rules that I use at my table, which you can see up here, and one of those rules was that I allow my players to freely assign their ability score bonuses, meaning they don't have to put them in the abilities dictated by their racial choice. Tasha's makes this an official option now and also presents official rules for swapping racial proficiencies, languages, and even gives you a framework to make your own race. I'm calling it now that when we eventually get a sixth edition, the player races as we know them won't exist and character creation will be a set of modular options that you can put together however you like. Then I think the standard races as we know them will be kind of pre-made options similar to how we get pre-gen character sheets in existing products. I want to know what you think about this though. Is that the way you expect character creation to go in the eventual 6th edition? Let me know down in the comments. Now I've talked before about how feats are one of my favourite parts of the game so I was super excited to dive into the feats presented in Tasha's Cauldron. Unfortunately most of them are far too specific to be attractive to the majority of character builds. There are a bunch of feats that are tied to weapon damage, making you more effective when using a particular damage type like slashing or piercing. Now feats like this are fine and having extra utility is always nice, but there's no flavour to them. They're pure crunch and they don't 
engage me on a character perspective. Now, fortunately, there are a couple of feats in the book that walk that kind of fine line between being useful utility feats and also having kind of flavor to your character. One of my favorites is the chef feat, which allows you to buff healing gain at a short rest. And you can kind of make a trail mix for your players to snack on to give them temporary HP when they're out adventuring. Then you've also got the Fey Touch and Shadow Touch feats that give you access to spells thanks to their connection to the Fey Wild or the Shadowfell. If you're only interested in feats for the benefits they offer mechanically, you're probably going to love this section. But for me, I found them to be a little bit empty overall. As an option I'm only going to get access to every four levels or so, I want something that makes me excited for more than just being able to hit something a little more often. Now the next section of the book is on group patrons, which were first introduced in Eberron Rising from the Last War, and then made their way back in Tasha's College of Everything. Now I love group patrons because they give you a really strong narrative reason for the party to be together. All belonging to the same organisation is a great way to have the party come together to start their adventures. Group patrons also offer the players a variety of resources that can come in really handy, such as guild halls where they can speak to people and learn valuable information, contracts for characters to earn additional income, or shelter for them to use to rest for a night or hide from the bad guys pursuing them. One new mechanic that is tied to the new patron system in this book that I do really like is the group assistance rules. It basically allows your character to grant another character advantage so long as they're not incapacitated. Now, I love that Wizards added a mechanical benefit to being part of a group patron because I feel like this will really incentivize the players to actually buy into the patronage system more than they otherwise would have. And the book includes eight example patrons with details on the types of adventures you might be sent on because of them, information on what contacts you'll make because of your affiliations, and some of them even pay a wage, which is a really great way to handle the day-to-day -day living expenses of the game without having to kind of bookkeep it. Unfortunately though, the section on being your own patron is woefully lacking. It's barely over 200 words long, and it basically amounts to saying, follow the rules for running a business in the DMG. Now, I don't know if you've ever read the rules for running a business in the DMG, but it's 150 words that basically comes down to roll a D100 and you'll see if you spend money or make money. What the hell, wizards? You had an opportunity here to provide a fantastic framework for something that could be really cool for the players, and this is what you did. You turned it into a chore. Where is the list of potential perks for being your own patron? What about a table of potential hirelings and the benefits they can bring you, or the types of contracts you might get as your own patrons? Or even a renowned system to represent your growing notoriety as an organisation? Hell, where's the list of potentially unique quests that might come as a result of being your own patron? Like having to deal with rival groups, or rescue some beleaguered members of your organisation, or deal with any other kind of complication? This is honestly one of the most frustrating parts of the whole book for me, as it was something I was really looking forward to the most and without it we're basically getting a reprint of the content that was in Eberron but with fewer examples. In fact I'm so frustrated by this that as soon as I'm done with this video I'm going to go away and write my own framework on being your own patron and that will be available over on my Patreon very soon. While we're talking about Patreon if you enjoy the content I make and want to support what I do Patreon is the best way to do it. As a patron you're going to get access to all kinds of benefits from being able to suggest and vote on video topics, a private channel in my discord server and monthly homebrew pdf content. This month I'm making a set of sidekicks to include in your games and I was going to make a a couple of homebrew group patrons to add some variety to the ones included in Tasha's, but instead I'm going to put together that framework and how to make your own. You'll find a free sample pack in the description below which will give you a taste of what you can get as a patron, so check it out. Thanks. I love you. Chapter 3 is a bit of a redemption for Tasha's Cauldron and it covers spells, magic items and magic tattoos. There's a bunch of new spells here and they range from being pretty mediocre to be honest to being quite cool. The first spell that we get in the book is called Blade of Disaster, a ninth level spell which sounds awesome and it sounds like it'll be really interesting but in reality it's just kind of the nuclear option of spiritual weapon and it just does a bunch of damage. It's not useless, don't get me wrong, but it's not dropping up to 40 dice on 4 40 foot spheres within a mile levels of bad ass that Meteor Swarm is. I want my ninth level spells to bend the fabric of reality, be able to lay low entire armies, or turn the tides of an entire war, and this just doesn't cut it. There are some really cool spells in the list though. Dream of the Blue Veil allows you to go hopping between realities, and it's a great way to get your group into or out of a setting like Ravenloft or Eberron for some nice variety in campaign settings. A chunk of the spells listed are summon spells for bringing in different creature types to aid you in combat, but we do get some cool psychic spells like Tasha's Mind Whip or Mind Sliver, and I always do love to see more psychic stuff in the official material. 
There is also a section that talks about how to customize your spells, such as altering the appearance of magic missiles so it looks like a bunch of chickens. This has no mechanical weight, but it's a nice inclusion that empowers magic users to roleplay more by giving them kind of free reign to customize their spell appearance. In terms of magic items, we get the usual mix here. Some of them are cooler or more useful than others, and some of them are really awesome. My favorite is absolutely Baba Yaga's Mortar and Pestle, which allows you to place an enemy inside it, grind them into a pulp, and then separate out all their bits to use as alchemical components. Amazing. I also think that the Crook of Rao is an incredible item and would be a great MacGuffin to fuel an entire campaign because it can banish all fiends under CR19 within an entire mile. As always, the details on how to destroy these items is super cool and evocative. And for a lot of items, the method for destroying them actually sounds like it would be a lot more engaging and fun than actually using the item itself. There is one trend that I'm not personally a fan of though, and that's assigning random properties to powerful magical items. On the one hand, it means that no two Crook of Rao are going to be the same, but there is so much variance in the magical item properties that I really wish the writers had just chosen a couple of them rather than leaving it to chance. I do recognise that some people are going to love the spice that comes from that chance, but for me, there's too much chance that you're going to end up with a really powerful magic item that's got a bit of a a bum ability. One thing that I think the book does nail with magic items though is the magical tattoos. I thought that these were excellent. I think most people think that the concept of magical tattoos is pretty awesome and there's a good mix of flavorful and useful effects in here. Rules as written, most of them are actually just a byproduct of a magic needle that you kind of hold against your skin. Personally, I would rule it so that only dedicated tattoo mages can kind of put these tattoos on you and you can't just give them to yourself without training, but that's just a matter of personal preference. And then finally we come to chapter four of the book which covers all of the dm tools for me this is easily the strongest section of the book and i think the reason is that it's the section that has the most new material in it that we've not really seen before sidekicks are reprinted and expanded upon from the essentials kit and you can now level them all the way to level 20 which is nice especially if you're running one-on-one -on -one games that is something that the book references a couple of times actually including in the section on session zero now for a lot of folks especially veteran players the section on session zero might feel like a pointless inclusion but i really appreciated it it's it's great for these common ideas to be represented in the official materials and it'll help normalize that kind of open communication between players in folks who are newer to the hobby. I especially appreciate that the session zero section directly calls out soft and hard limits and respecting the boundaries of your fellow players. This is a problem for an unfortunately high number of tables and having these kind of rules codified in the book is going to give those players experiencing that the kind of back in to say look this is not okay. The section on parlaying with monsters is also really cool and my favorite thing about it is the rules it gives you for researching the monsters. You could use these rules to get kind of that witcher or monster hunter world feel in your game and I absolutely love it. I'm also a big fan of official material providing non-combat solutions to encounters so the parlaying with monsters section gets a big thumbs up from me. The magical phenomena and environmental hazards are also nice additions to the game giving dungeon masters more options to make locations feel distinct and unique. My personal favorites are the haunted region which you can have your players harassed by spirits and then the mirror realm which can see the players reflections leaving the mirror and trying to kill them. It's super cool. And finally we come to the puzzles section. This is probably actually my favorite error of the whole book and it includes 13 puzzle types to throw at your players. What I like about this section is it includes hints for the puzzles that you can give to the players and it has notes on how to scale the difficulty of the puzzles and change them to be more versatile as well as handouts to give to the players. I know that next time I want to put a puzzle in front of my players I can just open this book and choose one of the options included and I'll end up with something that will provide an engaging challenge for them. My favorite is probably the tavern menu puzzle which the book presents as a way to get access to kind of a secret organization, a great hook and a puzzle for a kind of intrigue based game. So what are my overall thoughts on Tasha's Cauldron? Well, if Tasha's Cauldron was a meal, it would be one I've eaten a dozen times before and one that leaves me hungry again within an hour. Much of the content in the book is reprinted from other sources or it's updated from Unearthed Arcana, which means there isn't a lot here that's truly new. And while that ultimately results in more balanced content, thanks to more extensive playtesting, it does diminish the kind of value of the book for me. Things like being your own patron or the feats feel quite underdeveloped. And that patron thing especially really frustrates me because in the lead up to the release of this book, we were led to believe that there would be rules and mechanics for this and not just a paragraph telling us to use another set 
set of lackluster rules. Partly because of things like that, and then partly because so much of the content is reprinted from elsewhere, the book feels much thinner than I would have liked in terms of content. That being said, there are some really solid things going on in this book. The options available to characters are great, a lot of the standing traditions have been made official, and a lot of the new DM options, including parlaying with monsters, the puzzles, and magic tattoos, are particularly noteworthy. So then... Would I recommend Tasha's Cauldron of Everything? I think if you're a player who already has an established character, there's not really a huge reason to pick up this book. I think if you're only interested in the character options, I'd maybe pick up the subclass pack on D&D Beyond rather than the full book. If you're a dungeon master, the value you get from this book is going to vary quite wildly depending on a couple of different things. If you're a veteran DM who already owns a lot of the content in books like Eberron, Theros or Ravnica, a lot of the content in this is either going to be reprints of that material you already own, or it's going to be giving you suggestions on things that you already might be doing. If you're a new DM though, who only owns the three core books as well as maybe Xanathar's, there's probably enough content in here to make it worth your while with new ways to approach character creation, new ways to play and new tools for you to use. For me personally, I found Tasha's to contain a few gems, but overall it left me wanting more than it had to give. And I actually found myself far more excited by the Theros setting book earlier this year, which was a big shock for me because I run all homebrew all the time. But in Theros, I found more unique and new ideas that I hadn't seen before that sparked my imagination, whereas in Tasha's, I felt like I was covering ground I'd already tread before. But if you're interested in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and you're not sure whether you should spend the money on it, fear not, because I'm running a giveaway for a copy of the book on D&D Beyond, so you can get your hands on it with no fear of buyer's remorse. To enter into the giveaway, you just need to be a subscriber to the Icarus Games channel here on YouTube and leave a comment down in the comments below. I'll be picking the winner at random in one week's time on the 24th of November, so make sure to get your comments in early. I hope this video gave you some extra insight into the new release and has helped you decide whether it's one that you want to pick up. If you want to keep watching, check out my video on the house rules I use in my game right over here. But until next time, happy gaming.